Welcome to Created Equal, Clarence Thomas in his own words, featuring authors Michael Pack and Mark Paoletta. Please welcome John Malcolm, Vice President of the Heritage Foundation's Institute for Constitutional Government. Well, welcome everybody to the Heritage Foundation for a very, very special evening. Uh, during a recent interview, Professor John Yu, who was a former uh, Justice Thomas Clark, asked the justice if he would ever write a sequel to his outstanding memoir, My Grandfather's Son. He responded, only if I am convicted of some heinous crime. <laughs> this fabulous book is, in many ways, that sequel. Although when I, uh, when I said that to Justice Thomas, he replied, yes, but I didn't have to write it. <laughs> True enough. So we are extremely grateful that Michael Pack and Mark Paoletta did that. Gentlemen, if you will please come up on the stage uh, to join me. Uh, and I should point out, <laughs> I should point out that copies of this book are available for sale uh, outside, and, and they will be available after this event, and the authors would be delighted to, uh, to sign their, those copies. So Michael and his wife, Gina, run Manifold Productions, which is a documentary film company Together, they have produced several award-winning documentaries, including Created Equal, Clarence Thomas in his own words. Let's give a look at the screens and see just a little snippet of that film. Judge Thomas, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Please be seated. When I was six, I wandered the streets by myself. You were hungry and didn't know when you'd eat. Some place in my life, the road split off. I had gone to the seminary. I had gone to all white schools. I was never going to be a part of that world. I was never going to be white. The problem is I can never go back completely to the world I came from. We're supposed to be revolutionaries. We were for anybody who's kind of in your face. I saw what I had become, lashing out at every single thing. And then I asked God that if you take anger out of my heart, I'll never hate again. And that was the beginning of the slow return to where I started. I want my candidacy to unify our country. I was under a constant attack. You're not really black because you're not doing what we expect black people to do. That I will nominate Judge Clarence Thomas to serve as Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. That's when all heck broke loose. Judge Thomas began to use work situations to discuss sex. We know exactly what's going on here. This is the wrong black guy. He has to be destroyed. He really didn't matter. What mattered was what they wanted. So you'd still like to serve on the Supreme Court? I'd rather die than withdraw from the process. I wouldn't be able to say I lived up to my oath and did my best. It's a terrific... Uh... It's a terrific film. Uh, and it's also, by the way, available through streaming services on, and on Amazon. Uh, in addition to being a documentary filmmaker, Michael has served as president and CEO of the Claremont Institute, as an executive for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and as CEO of the U.S. Agency for Global Media. Mark Paoletta is a partner at the firm of Cher Jaffe. He has served in many prominent positions in government, including as general counsel at the Office of Management and Budget, chief counsel to Vice President Mike Pence, and as assistant counsel to President George H.W. Bush. It was in this last position where Mark first met Justice Clarence Thomas. And to quote a famous line from the movie Casablanca, it was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. 
When Michael was filming Created Equal, he actually interviewed Justice Thomas and Ginny Thomas for roughly 30 hours, only two of which uh, made it into the final film, although I gather that my, Michael liked the initial nine-hour version. Uh, <laughs> this book covers a lot of the material that didn't make it into the final film, although it could have. It is a pleasure to have you both here this evening. So, Michael, how did you get involved in this project and what was there about Justice Thomas that led you to believe that his story just had to be told? Well, the, the project started when some of Justice Thomas's friends um, were upset that his enemies on the left, broadly speaking, was telling his story. And they wanted to get his story out his way. This was the time that HBO was coming out with confirmation, with Kerry Washington playing Anita Hill. And, they thought his story needed to get out there, and the, I knew some of these people too, and they approached me, and I didn't really know much about Justice Thomas or his story. But as you know, you meet him once, and you can see here's a, a, a tremendously warm and interesting man with a great life story and who is a great storyteller. So then right away I wanted to do the film, and I conceived it as a whole life story. Originally it was going to be more narrowly focused. And it took me a while to come up with the format of Clarence Thomas in his own words, where we shot him, as you said, we interviewed him and Justice and Ginny for over 30 hours, and he looks directly at the camera, as you can see from the trailer, and tells his story from the beginning to today in his own words. So you can see what he thought of the confirmation hearing and of all the other things that happened to him. Um, and as I have to, to slightly to make something that you said a little clearer. So it was originally 30 hours, and we winnowed it down in the first pass to nine. And it's Mark who thought it was perfect at nine. <laughs> it was fine. Didn't need to, no, nothing needed to be changed. It was. So, but you know, PBS, they wanted it two hours. We wanted it to be two hours. And in fact, it was missing all the visuals for that matter. And so we made it two hours. But Mark always wanted the missing stuff to, to, get to, uh, to get to readers. And he came up with the idea of doing the book. And that's how the book began. Now, it's, it's a terrific book. Uh, so, Mark, you first met uh, Justice Thomas when you were in college, and he was chairman of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And the next time uh, you met him was when you were a young lawyer in the Bush uh, White House and, and knew that President Bush was thinking about nominating him to the D.C. Circuit. You were involved in the vetting process. And then you worked uh, on Justice Thomas's confirmation to the Supreme Court, and that was certainly an ordeal. Uh, Justice Thomas, of course, described us at length in his book, and, he, and indeed he says that you were with him every step of the way and that but for your uh, efforts and assistance, he would not have been confirmed to the Supreme Court. Uh, so tell us about a little bit about this history, your initial impressions of Justice Thomas when you were in college, when you dealt with him, uh, when he was nominated to the D.C. Circuit, and then going through this ordeal with him. Probably the same impression that most people you know, have when they first meet Clarence Thomas, which is, uh, wow. Uh, I was a senior in college and had the opportunity to sit and, and talk with him for about an hour in Bridgeport, Connecticut, of all places, my hometown. And, you know, the energy and vibrancy and how he related uh, to me and the people there and just engaging. And it was just electrifying to me. Um, it was just an hour out of my life, uh, unexpected. Um, it was a uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush was, had gone up to Bridgeport to campaign for my uncle. Um, who was the Republican mayor of Bridgeport, and there was a separate event where Justice, uh, then EEOC chairman uh, Clarence Thomas was, and uh, connected up with him. And then flash forward to uh, 1989 when we're in the White House. I was a uh, servant on the Judicial Selection Committee, and um, I volunteered to reach out to him to get his materials, uh, his speeches, his um, articles, things he had done, because we were going to vet him. And people were very interested in him. There had been some talk of, on the transition team, but this was kind of the first formal outreach to him. Um, and when I, he sent me a big stack. When I called him, I ended up talking to him for about an hour. And, you know, just again, having a, a time in my life. I'm 26 years old, and here's this German treating me very nicely and kind of, you know, um, engaging with me. Uh, and when I read his stuff, it was just, again, electrifying. I remember being so excited that he was just trashing, taking on Congress uh, and the, and the uh, civil rights leadership groups and just, you know, speaking truth to power, if you will. And he describes all that at length in the book, too. He does, yeah. And, and I thought, you know, this was a Democrat Senate at the time. And I was thinking, well, this would be tough to get him confirmed. But that was my first 
kind of interaction with him and getting to know him and talking with him in that process. Uh, and as you said, it was the beginning of a lifelong friendship. Well, then, then talk about, let's move, move further along. What happened then with the Supreme Court confirmation? Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, originally, you know, just, um, when, when Brennan retired, uh, President Bush wanted to do uh, Clarence Thomas for uh, the Supreme Court. Um, but uh, Boyd and Gray thought he should stay on the, uh, the D.C. Circuit a little bit longer. But the president, I think, recognized in Clarence Thomas the best of America. And, you know, at the end of the day, when, Justice, when President Bush talks about the best qualified person, there was this, this uh, um, criticism of President Bush when he used those terms. I actually believe the president was exactly right because what, takes, what makes the best justice is courage. And I think he, we had seen, and President Bush had seen, that just Clarence Thomas as EEOC chairman, as the Department of um, Education Assistant Secretary, he had been under fire his entire time in Washington and had never buckled. And to me, that's the most important ingredient for a successful Supreme Court justice. You know, faithful to your, your oath uh, and to the Constitution, but courage is actually the most important ingredient. Um, and uh, so when he gets picked for, um, when Thurgood Marshall resigns in uh, June of 1991, again, it's pretty quick. Uh, um, uh, when just, uh, President Bush picked him on July 1st. And from the moment he was selected, and there was a press conference, if you remember, up in Kitty Monkport, and, and Clarence Thomas said those great words, only in America, right, which just you know, was, was perfect. From that moment on, it was just a complete attack uh, and try and destroy this guy, um, somebody we should be celebrating, uh, and you know, sort of, you know, you, you could go through the pieces and, and, and go through his judicial philosophy and all that stuff, but to, to, to malign his life was what we faced the entire summer. So my whole summer was kind of beating back, <laughs> you know, all of these rumors or allegations or smears on him, um, and you know, I had gotten to know him by this point, and uh, the first weekend of of the confirmation uh, effort after July 1st, that s Saturday, he brought me to his chambers, he asked me to come over, and we went through his entire Rolodex. And he, he let me know who his friends were, and we're, we're from different parts of his life, so as things came up, I could call and you know, get the information we needed to, to rebut whatever, whatever was cycling out there. So by the time the Anita Hill stuff comes along, it, that, you know, we had been under siege, he had been under siege since July 1, uh, and that just obviously ended up to a, another level. But, um, it was obviously through that process uh, that we became very close. Yeah, no, it's been quite something to watch that painful ordeal through the eyes of the Thomases. Uh, so, Mark, you also tell a marvelous uh, story about the time shortly after Justice Thomas was confirmed to the court uh, yeah. when you were diagnosed with cancer. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so again, uh, working from the clock uh, on that confirmation, he gets confirmed on October 15th, um, and he's just beaten, right? He's just destroyed. Um, one thing to know is Justice Thomas went on the court, uh, and it, it, it was delayed, right? First Monday in October is when the court convenes. And he went into his first conference and actually persuaded Rehnquist and Scalia to change their votes um, on, on some cases. Uh, so again, these criticisms and smears of Justice Thomas, you know, being dependent on Justice Scalia was a complete lie, right? Obviously forever, but from the get-go in, in, with, this, with this first conference. But um, a few months later, I was diagnosed with cancer, and it was um, it was obviously a very devastating um, you know event for me. Um, and I called uh, Clarence and came over, uh, spent every day either calling me or visiting me, coming to see me in the hospital. I had to go out to Indiana to get treatment, chemotherapy. Called me every day, sent me you know packages, books, pies, took me out for <laughs> hamburgers. Took me to his home where he was building, uh, the, the home, home he lives in now. Um, we helped design an island. And every time I'm over there, um, and my wife is here, you know, that's Mark's Island. We designed this together. So he's just a true friend. And, and I'm very cognizant of he's, he's that way with me, but he's that way with everyone he comes in contact with and is a, is a friend with. And it's, um, it's just really special. And part of the reason I wanted to do this book was to get that story of Justice Thomas out there more to the American people know about him because he's so uninterested uh, in, you know, defending his reputation. In the back of the book is, um, is the litany of humility, which hangs in his chambers uh, and just, you know, personifies Clarence Thomas. Uh, and so, as Michael said, after this, this, um, this terrible movie in 2016, 
which sort of the silver lining was it motivated people uh, to, to do things to make a movie, um, uh, is, is to get that out there and, and, and get his story out there more. You said that uh, when you had cancer, you had a picture of yourself that he commented on. Which oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I'd gone through chemotherapy. I was convinced that I wasn't going to lose my hair. Um, and told the doctor somehow I'm different, but it all fell out. And um, I was bald, and um, it grew back really wavy. It was weird. Um, and, um, and so uh, I think Ginny took a photo of the two of us uh, when my hair had come back, and it was very wavy. And, uh, and he wrote, uh, great hair, buddy. We survived. And so I do think you know, in, those two things were bookended in terms of you know, his, his ordeal and my ordeal and how we supported each other through that. And that really forged our, our friendship um, that's lasted a, 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 a lifetime. A wonderful story. Uh, so Justice Thomas's relationship with his grandfather obviously played a central role in his memoirs, played a central role in, uh, in your movie and, and, and in this book. Uh, so his grandfather, Myers uh, Anderson, was obviously a very tough taskmaster. Uh, he insisted that you had to earn everything by the sweat of your brow, uh, and he told his grandson, old man can't is dead. I helped bury him. Mm. Michael, uh, can you describe a little bit Justice Thomas's relationship with his grandfather and what kind of an impact it had and continues to have in his life? Absolutely. And actually, one of the good things about the book, oh, it's many good things, is there was really not enough of those grandfather's sayings in the movie. He has a whole bunch of them, and many, many more of them, but not all, are in the book. And they're equally pithy. I mean, so I mean, the, the story with his grandfather is he was, you know, he was, you, most people here may know his, 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 his basic story, you know, born in Pinpoint in a Gullah speaking area, then, then brought to Savannah when he was about six years old by his mother with his brother, and there they were in dire poverty in the segregated South, and his mother couldn't take care of them, and brought. Justice Thomas and his and his brother to her father, his grandfather, to raise. And Justice Thomas always said that walk was the most important event in his life and, and changed things around. And his grandfather did turn everything around. He gave him values and hard work and discipline, as that that's, that, that 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 phrase you you uh, you cited it, it illustrates. And the very first thing I think he said to the two boys is, "The damn vacation is over." As Clarence Thomas said, but what vacation was he talking about? <laughs> you know, they had been like starving in Savannah. So, uh, and it was really hard work all the time. When he went back, went, went to school, he couldn't do sports. He had to work on the home, on the heating oil truck with his grandfather. He gave him this discipline and hard work, and perhaps equally crucial, he sent him to parochial schools. Then this is the segregated South, black schools run by these Irish nuns. And they, too, continue to give him discipline, hard work, and, and a solid curriculum. And Justice Thomas thrived under those circumstances. As you know, he later rebelled against them and then came back. But, but that was his core. You, know, you can see at the end of the trailer that he ha he's in the, his chambers looking up at the portrait of his, the bust of his grandfather that Ginny had made. And it's there for him to look at and think about. And it has the Old Man Can't is Dead title below it. And, it, it reminds Justice Thomas where he came from and what his principles are, and I think it's his, his guide, his, his lodestar in life. Yeah, you, you mentioned the phrases. There's one in there about a monkey with cayenne. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then you have, there's also, you know, he, he was tough because you said the door opened when he came in. He said he rebelled. That's you said, well, that, that door can swing the other way. Right. And it, it did swing the other way, although they, they, they clearly ended up uh, reconciling, which is, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, if someone could please turn off their phone. I would appreciate that. Uh, so in addition uh, to his grandfather, you described in, in, at length in the book other books and people who, uh, who influenced him. So there's Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington. He talks about Richard Wright's native son, uh, Anne Rand, Thomas Sowell, Senator John Danforth, the Franciscan nuns, especially Sister Mar Mary of Virgilius. So a, a common theme that struck me among all of them is they taught Justice Thomas from a very early age that there was nothing that you couldn't achieve through hard work, uh, that excuses for failing to live up, live up to one's potential was, was unacceptable, and that he, had, he could think and act for himself. Uh, so Mark, I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about some of these influences on, uh, on his life. Yeah, I mean, it, it, To Kill a Mockingbird, and, uh, but, but really, the, I think the Ayn Rand um, fountainhead, um, he, he returns to it over and over. I think, in fact, when we 
two of the subtitles in the book are Fountainhead. Uh, and uh, um, I think that's right. He, he, he is fiercely independent, and I think he read these books and found, you know, these the, these answers or these these approaches to life that he that he then built into his his own life, uh, and doing your own thing and, and thinking for yourself and resisting the the the, 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 the you know the, the pressure of the mob to conform to what they want you to do, um, and so. Uh, he, he, and, he, and he relates back to it even in, in his confirmation with, uh, with The Kill a Mockingbird and the mob uh, coming for um, Tom Robinson, right? And so um, he, he reads nonstop, uh, even to this day. Uh, I call him, I you know, talk to him often, and he's always on another book. My wife and, 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 and Clarence exchange book ideas, and they're, you know, um, the Vikings, um, you know, um, uh, Vanderbilt, uh, Carnegie, um, the Plantagenets, I mean, just all over the place, but it's just a thirst for knowledge um, that he's doing even to this day um, as a Supreme Court Justice, which is really um, just amazing. I know he, he tries to impart some of that to his law clerks. He makes them watch a movie version of The Fountainhead. Uh, I, I, I've Opinions vary on the quality I, I, of that That's movie. what I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> I do not like it much, but, you know, the, I try to give Clarence Thomas the chance to say whether it's good or bad in the film. <laughs> but I'm a... And you go back to Invisible Man, right? That's another one that comes yeah. up a lot. Um, and where, you know, the worst I've been treated was when I told the truth, right? Uh, the protagonist in, in, in Invisible Man. And, and again, th that you're all supposed to tell this lie and everyone's supposed to act out on the stereotypes of how I'm supposed to act and then how I'm supposed to act towards you. And that's something he's just been resisting, you know, and he, and he went back to that several times uh, during the interview. And it's, to me, it was really fascinating, all of these books that he had read, even um, Native Son by Richard Wright, and the idea of, he talks about um, being on that knife's edge of walking and circumstances, and when you make that step, do you fall, free fall, as a kid coming out of pinpoint and having nothing, right, and, 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 and being careful and always watching, you know, if I, it sort of ties into the anger uh, as he's coming up and when he goes through all of these racial um, insults or slights or actions against him and he wants to, you know, explode, uh, rightfully so, and he doesn't. And he always talks about how his grandfather in the, in the segregated South, you know, learned, you know, anger can consume you. And so you see that with the native son and Richard, you know, Richard Wright's native son. Uh, and so the, 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 I, I love those discussions. It's something you don't get in the book, uh, I mean, the movie, or, or in, I was going to say, or is in memoirs as much. Uh, and so. And one of the things I'm struck with Justice Thomas in these books is that, I mean, for one thing, you were right. They have this independence in, in common. He doesn't like to be told what to do. Did not make it easy to direct him as the director of the film. <laughs> I had needed more, all Mark's help at some <laughs> crucial moments, and my wife, Gina's. Uh, and my son, Alex, was there as a PA also. You know, he, it's, you need to... He, so, however, the, the thing that's impressive to me, as someone who was on the left myself when I was younger, is that he fought his way largely to the conservative viewpoint. He was very influenced by Thomas Sowell. Of course, they eventually became friends, but he first experienced Thomas Sowell in a book, and he thought himself out of the box of being a radical, as he likes to say, a black power advocate, a, a believer in, you know, in radical ideas. He fought his way out you know, by th rethinking it and testing it against his life experience. And that's a notable achievement. And, and, and he, he pulled from these books just what he needed. You know, he pulled the independence from Ayn Rand, but perhaps not her view of religion. Right? He took what he needed from these books. And that's how we created the worldview he has today. Yeah, I think thinking your way out is a very good description of that sort of theme that works through yeah. throughout the book. And, uh, Mark, and, and, I, in his evolution, um, he actually first time he came across Thomas Sowell, he threw the book in the, in the, right. in the garbage. <laughs> uh, and so we were talking a little bit about influences, and so I, I just have to ask you, Mark. I, I know that uh, Justice Thomas has, has made several trips to my hometown, Tenafly, mm -hmm. New Jersey. Uh, where several of the nuns yeah. who uh, yeah. who taught him uh, were in in retirement. Can you talk a little bit about these? Sure. Things? So the nuns, again, as as Michael said, the two most formative developments in Clarence Thomas's life 
is going to live with his grandfather uh, and, gra and grandmother uh, when he was seven years old uh, in 1955. And his grandfather enrolling him in the, in the Catholic schools, which is St. Benedict's, which is segregated all black school, um, where Clarence Thomas got a fantastic education, which he always stresses, uh, both there and in the seminary uh, when he went uh, to St. John Vianney. Um, but they were run, this St. Benedict was run by these, these nuns, most of them from Ireland, and they were very tough. But as Clarence talks about in the book, you know, they loved you, but they, they held you to a high standard to get you ready uh, for this tough world you were entering. So the high standards, even in this terrible, you know, segregated South, um, you know, um, that black and whites were equal in the nuns' eyes, and we're going to hold you to those standards. And that really has made all the difference throughout Clarence Thomas's life. And he's remembered that. And what's really amazing to me in terms of, you know, talking to Justice Thomas regularly, that nuns come up all the time in his discussions. And so he goes through, he falls away from the church, he still stays in touch with the nuns, but in the 80s, when he's in the Reagan administration, he actually goes to seek them out up in Boston, Sister Virgilius and, and some of the other sisters who are in, uh, retired, to thank them for not letting him fall into victimhood and to believing in him and holding him to those high standards. And um, so forward to the, to the confirmation, we actually, uh, somebody recommends that Sister Virgilius testify on behalf of, of Clarence Thomas. And um, she had broken her arm uh, around that time, and I called and asked her to come down and testify. She said, I can't, I can't testify. I broke my arm. I go, what's wrong with that? You can get driven uh, down to Washington, and she's 80 years old at this time. So she, she ends up, I pick her up and bring her down, and she ends up testifying, and that began a, friend, a friendship with her, with us, with uh, my family and, and, um, and Sister Virgilius. But Justice Thomas and I, for about 15 years, and every Martin Luther King Day, it usually worked out, sometimes others, depending on the schedule. We would drive up to Tenafly, where the, it's the Franciscan Sisters of the Immaculate Conception Order. That's one of their retirement uh, convents. Uh, and there were about 80 of them that were living there when we first started going up there. The youngest, probably 65. The oldest was 108. Um, and all living you know, in this community um, with a, somebody who made their food and stuff like that, but basically on their own, uh, taking care of each other. And we'd drive up, I'd get over his house around 6 in the morning. It was just the two of us would drive up to Tenafly, get there on 10. He would visit with every single sister, uh, a lot of them in the infirmary. And we'd spend the day, we'd have, we'd have um, lunch with them, uh, and then we'd head back down. And um, I think, I, yeah, this is Sister Virgilius right here. So this was the, his eighth grade teacher and um, the, the, the principal of, um, of St. Benedict's. She died in 2013 when she was 100 years old. This is probably when, I think this is maybe 2006 or so. She's probably in her 80s here. Uh, but we'd go up, and I took, I took these photos. Um, that's obviously Clarence talking to, to Sister Virgilius. Um, this is the cafeteria where we'd sit. And you can see there's, there's uh, Clarence um, and a room full of sisters. And, um, and he knew all of them. You know what I mean? It's like, that's the thing about Clarence Thomas. Once he knows about you, he'll, he'll ask about your mother or your brother or, you know, whatever it is. And um, so these are some of the, the photos uh, of, uh, of him and how he never forgot them and was always grateful to them. There's Sister Virgilius, I think, when she's probably 90, 99 years old or so. And, um, and we went up to her funeral and... Uh, the two of us, and outside of, I think, one or two family members and the rest of the sisters, we were the only ones there. Uh, and again, just reflects on Justice Thomas, you know, his gratefulness and just being loyal to the people who helped him. And, you know, this, there was a beautiful um, comment by um, Justice Sotomayor the other day about Justice Thomas and how he knows everyone in the courthouse and, he's, you know, and it's all true. It was a beautiful statement, that part of it. There's another part of it, though, where she said something like, Justice Thomas and I disagree on, on helping people. He thinks people should pull themselves up by the, their bootstraps, and I, don't, I think that some people can't reach their bootstraps and they need help. Justice Thomas has never said that, <laughs> okay? Um, he believes in hard work and accountability, uh, but he recognizes over and over and over from the, the speech he gave it um, uh, when he was nominated, the, the people he, he, he thanked were his grandfather and, his, and the nuns, uh, they were the but fours. So it wasn't bootstraps. It was people in your community, not the government, right, that would help you, you know, make it.
hold you accountable, not let you make excuses, not let you fall into victimhood, as he says. And so um, one last thing here, I think it's right here. This statue right here was made, and this was unveiled the week before um, his um, the 30th anniversary, when Heritage had the event here. The following weekend, we went up to New York. Uh, this is in New Jersey. Justice Thomas, he talked about this so much. This is a statue of Sister Virgilius there. And then the, t the two young students, the, 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 the young boy has a, a, a note he's holding. And on it, the, the sculptor put Clarence Thomas uh, on the top of the, the paper. And then uh, JMJ, Jesus, Mary, Joseph uh, on the paper, which is what they used to do at St. Benedict's. Um, but he went up there. There were probably 25 nuns who could make it because uh, they're so old now. But they all came out to this place. And Clarence spoke. And was, it was so emotional for him. To, to speak there, and um, but but in the midst of him being honored at, to, for being on the court for 30 years, I know he cared about this, and you did a great job, job, John. You know, here, this is something that he was really, really excited about, and um, and and so it's it's at a seminary, uh, cemetery where there are 200 sisters buried. So with the Ten and Fly Convent, where they had been being buried in back, they they needed to move them out for a variety of reasons, and. They reburied them out here in Mawa, New Jersey, and um, that's where the statue is. I've got a couple of more uh, questions, and then we're going to be getting to audience questions to so start to be thinking about those. Uh, and, and I want to read a couple of passages from the book and sort of get you to comment. And it's a toss up, either one of you can get it. Uh, so, Justice Thomas talks a lot about having been raised in the segregated uh, South, where he was subjected, obviously, to very, very many uh, indignities. But he said that he was not until he was subjected to elitists from the Northeast, whom he describes in the book as self-proclaimed tolerant people, that he felt defamed. Uh, and in one passage, he speaks about, uh, he's speaking about the confirmation hearing, and he says this, I felt as though in my life I had been looking at the wrong people who would be problematic toward me. We were told that, oh, it's going to be the bigot in the pickup truck. It's going to be the Klansman. It's going to be the rural sheriff. And I'm not saying that there weren't some of those who were bad, but it turned out that through all of that, that ultimately the biggest impediment was the modern day liberal. They were the ones who would discount all those things because they have one issue, in this case it was abortion, or because they have the authority or the power to caricature you. I wonder what the whether you could comment on that. I think that is a very moving part of the book, and part of it is in the film. And I think he's right. I mean, he he often make, draws this distinction, and it's in the book, I think maybe twice, that between um, rattlesnakes and water moccasins. You know, right. One of them strikes you in, you know, in, in the open, and the other kind of hides. And, what? His grandfather's example of His this. grandfather made those distinctions. And some people are hiding and doing it in a sneaky way. And, you know, I had intended to put it in the movie. In fact, we got lots of footage of rattlesnakes and water moccasins. <laughs> <laughs> you were in Pinpoint, Georgia. Anyway, <laughs> it's really actually not so easy to get that footage. And there's so many different species. But that aside, didn't make it into the film. So I'm happy it's in the book. And it's a good distinction. And I think Clarence Thomas is getting at that there, that the people up north were in the water moccasin category, this sort of sneaky thing. And that was worse. You know, you didn't know where it was coming from. You didn't know where it, it took you by surprise. It wasn't as open and out front as the races and the Battlesnake experience. gave you a warning. Battlesnake was there. It gives you a warning, strikes you in a kind of fair fight sort of way. So, and I think we see that now. I mean, uh, you know, I think, I think contemporary progressives have a kind of racism that is also, you know, water moccasin-like, if I might say, and is in some ways more devastating, especially to young you know, black people coming up, actually, and encourages a kind of victimhood that this is what Mark alluded to earlier, that Clarence Thomas wasn't allowed to fall into by the nuns and by his grandfather. And now they're encouraged to by this new kind of racism. And I think it's very dangerous. And I think that's, you know, if people were reading the book seriously, that would be one of the most controversial things to people on the left if they took it to heart and took it seriously. Mark, I'll let you answer. Uh, respond to the next quote. Uh, he also compares, Justice Thomas also compares the experience uh, they had in public li with the public library in Savannah while growing up with how elitists expected him as a black man to, uh, to act. And, and he rebelled uh, against that. And he says the following. So let's take an example. 
We agreed that it was wrong for me to be prevented from going to the Savannah Public Library. Okay, people agree. That's just against society. So then, okay, what if they let me go in the library, but they said there's a certain part of the library or certain stacks in there that are off limits to black people? Mm. Oh, that would also be wrong. Oh, okay. What if they say there's certain books that are marked no coloreds allowed? Would that be right? No, that would be wrong. If all those things are wrong, it's wrong for them to prevent me from being in the library. It's wrong for them to prevent me from going to certain parts of the library. It's wrong for them to prevent me from going to certain books in the library. Why is it right for them to tell me I can't have certain thoughts that are in the books in the library? Obviously, there's no answer. It's absurd. Mark? Um, that is the passage that made you want to do this book. That's true. <laughs> Michael knows. That is I true. was sitting there, and you have a great voice, John, but it was nothing <laughs> like Clarence I, Thomas. I was not pretending to be Justin Thomas. Being very, <laughs> you know, his, it, the way he was delivering that, uh, and I was sitting there off to the side where I sat during the filming, it just being just captivated by this uh, and thinking, this is, this is perfect. Like this, this is the perfect way to describe the absurdity, right? on so many levels. And um, so when it came time for the film, I, I kept trying to tell Michael that it needed to be in the film. It's just a really long passage. And so it never made it in the film. Uh, but it became the, the cornerstone for, for this project of like, this, that is the one thing that I kept thinking back to that I want to get out because it's, I couldn't do it justice, right? When I, I describe it to people um, and what he said and how he said it. And that's what's the magic of Justice Thomas. He, on, on all these issues, just the way he describes them and explains them is so just spot on. And, um, and, and again, the, the hypocrisy of the left. I mean, this book, you know, Justice Thomas says a number of things about the left, the liberals, you know, and their tactics and their policies in the book, in his memoirs. He says that and then some in this book uh, because it was more free-flowing and you get his... Um, you, you know, just denunciation of, 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 their, of, their, of their views and their policies and why they, they're not interested in helping people, black people, poor people, you know, white people. Um, you, you know, they have their own view of what they want and that's all they care about. And it goes back to, in fact, you know, when he was in law school, I was talking about this earlier today, he worked at the New Haven Legal Assistance where he was in the, the, the field for the entire time he was there, day in and day out. And he talks about, the people up in the ivory tower have these macro theories, right? It comes up in the movie a little bit, but they have these great theories that have zero, you know, practical, you know, that could do lasting damage, but they're fixed on it. And that's what he hates the most, are those people who have their ideas, who want a virtue signal and pat themselves on the back, right? Just like with mismatch. They want to pat themselves on the back with getting students into to schools, again, black or white, who are not ready for a Harvard or whatever. And they don't get them ready for those schools, right? And that's what the nuns did. That's what his grandfather did in terms of getting him ready to, to, to go to that level. And as he said, I'd rather have somebody, you know, graduate with a 4.0 from a community college than fail out of Harvard. And um, so you see that come with this passage. It all goes to, you know, the absurdity of the left uh, and their views and, and the fact that you have to sing from a certain song sheet or you will be defamed, you will be caricatured, you will be destroyed. And that's Justice Thomas's entire life uh, since he's come to Washington. Um, and as you, as you know, he saw it, right, when he first started kind of moving towards Thomas Sowell uh, in the 70s and having these, you know, kind of coming around to uh, kind of Thomas Sowell's views, his own views on these things, and being worried that he would be destroyed if he entered public life and why he was kind of reluctant to do that. Um, so, but having the courage to do it nevertheless, right, and come what may, this is what I believe, this is what I'm going to do. There, there are various poignant passages in the book where he talks about, well, people come, elitists come up with these wonderful theories, but real lives are impacted, and many of them are ruined or sort of thrown away, and they are basically swept under the rug, and yeah. no one's really paying attention to that. One of the great ones he talks about is busing. Yeah. Right? Busing was, you know, so, you know, you know busing black students to a, a white neighborhood, white students to a, a black neighborhood, and the education is, is not good in either of them, right? And they're all, and, and, and it was supposed to be to improve the education, right? 
And, and when Clarence ends up at the Department of Education, he asks for all the data as to, okay, you know, show me the data to show that this worked. And several people there told him after several times of asking for it. We didn't do it for that. We did it to integrate this, the neighborhoods, and we lied, or the p people who were pushing busing were, were lying about the reasons for why, the, you know, and again, it's a social experiment that caused a lot of, you know, dislocation and, uh, and, and problems. Uh, it really does say you can't treat people like guinea pigs. It's very poignant. So with that, I want to open it up. Uh, I would say that, you know, please ask whatever questions you would like, but you are here to ask a question, not to give a speech. Uh, so if you would uh, raise your hands, and we will, I will have one of the people with the microphones deliver it to you. I guess while we are waiting for people to be brave enough, is that a hand or, or no? Okay. Oh, Trisha, yes. No, you just said raising your hand. Okay. Uh, well, while, while we're waiting for people to, to raise oh. their hands, to bring a microphone down here, I just want to ask, is there anything else that you want people to know that I haven't asked you about, about either the book or about Justice Thomas? What have I left out? Have well, I mean, we, we have to say that, you know, you can buy the book on Amazon.com or, uh, or right outside or anywhere <laughs> else. What? The, the other thing, uh, you out know, here, and that's uh, right, and they're for sale afterwards out here. They're still out here, and Mark and I will sign them. And the movie, as you said in the, the introduction, is still streaming on Amazon and many other places. And if you go to our website, manifoldproductions.com, you can find out how to stream it for free and in other ways. So I think the film and the book really speaks for themselves. And Justice Thomas is very articulate. And the whole point is to hear it directly from him. Mark is a p very passionate, and he tells the story as well. But as he said about your speaking voice, it's better to hear it directly from Justice Thomas. Mark would be the first to agree. And it's very moving, and it's one thing for us to say that progressives and, and the left, their, their soft bigotry is just as bad as the hard bigotry from the South. It's one thing for us to say it, but for Justice Thomas to say it with his life story and his background is compelling in a different way. That's so I appeal to you all to see the movie and read the book. Or both. Or both. Okay. Just one thing. Uh, for years, uh, Justice Thomas was famous for being um, not speaking out very much publicly. And he was criticized by liberals for that. But la lately, it seems like he is speaking out more. And of course, now the liberals are criticizing him for doing that. I was, <laughs> I was just wondering, uh, based on your own personal friendship with him, if you have any thoughts about why he is speaking out a little bit more of these lately. Yeah. So again, if, if, if what Justice Thomas said is that he thought that the court was kind of showboating, right? The justices were trying to not really elicit information um, from the, the litigant, uh, the lawyer in, in making the, in the argument, but to score points and to signal my, the, the, that justice's arguments and sort of spar maybe with another justice uh, on, on where they're coming from. And he, and he says in the book at, at one point, uh, talking about this, imagine if you went to Thanksgiving dinner and everyone's talking at the same time. You, you know, it would be useless. And so I think he didn't like that and you know, classic Clarence Thomas sort of didn't want to participate in it because he didn't like that style. Um, and, um, and, and, and as he says in the, in, in the book, you know, a person comes to make their case before the Supreme Court, he should be able to leave and say, I got to make my case. I may win or lose, but I got to make it. And if you've been to a, a, an oral argument, you know, in the past, they, the justice could jump in in 30 seconds into your argument and interrupt you and start you know, peppering you on something. Um, uh, since COVID, right, uh, what happened is uh, they, uh, they first moved virtual, right, so that everyone was doing it from their homes and not, not sitting in the courtroom. And the Chief Justice instituted a, a, a process where everyone went in order by seniority. So every single case after that, Justice Thomas asked a question, and now they moved back into, uh, into the courtroom, and it's the same process. And you know what that is? That's orderly, right? And just like Justice Thomas talks about, like you can listen to the, the, the lawyer make his argument, and then the chief is going to recognize the votes. It's not people kind of jumping on top of each other and interrupting. So it's perfectly consistent, if you will, with, with Justice Thomas's views on that process. The other thing is, the most important thing a Supreme Court justice does, his job, is to vote on cases and write opinions. And in that score, Justice Thomas is the most prolific justice in modern history. He writes, he has the most opinions. He's been on the court the longest, so he's had something like 760, 780 right now. But more importantly, he writes more opinions per year than any justice by far. 
Okay, so the, he's up in the in the 30s generally every year. I think he topped out. Kerry might know this. At 39 was is the most he wrote in one 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 um, one term. By way of comparison, and again, I, it's not to you know, Justice Kagan writes 10 opinions per year. Justice, Chief Justice Roberts writes 12 opinions per year. Um, Breyer writes. This is in my footnotes. Okay, so you can look at the footnotes. Um, um, 18 per year, right? And so Justice Thomas has. And again, uh, Kerry's here as one of his clerks. He goes through the, the opinions, and he is going to revisit, you know, old precedents, if you will, where the court m made a decision a long time ago, and then things have built on top of that. But if you go back to the beginning, that was wrong. And so he is on, on so many opinions. He's writing uh, on so many cases. He's going back and, and unearthing. And, and it's this project, I think, as he calls it, uh, of, of, of looking at long settled cases and, and, and either you know, writing a concurrence and offering up, hey, we should take a look at this. And you're seeing so many of, uh, cases now where Justice Thomas wrote a concurrence or dissent that are now becoming majority opinions uh, because of the force of his persuasiveness on cases. Um, there was a case, um, I think earlier this year, uh, Kerry, that was uh, Americans for Prosperity, where uh, the, the, last term, yeah. Hmm? I think it was last term. But oh, last term, where um, I think a couple terms earlier, Justice Thomas was the only um, person in dissent, as a, as a solo dissent, and, and they just ruled last year six to three in the majority. And, so, and Justice Sotomayor said, "How did this, how did this issue that had one vote a few years ago turn into a six-three uh, decision? Uh, you know, in Clarence Thomas's favor." So, the most important thing is this idea that Justice Thomas, again, I think it's born of racism by the left, okay, uh, that sought to make Justice Thomas, um, uh, you know, dependent on Justice Scalia and all those sorts of outrageous things, right, from the get-go. Michael does a great job of, of covering that in the movie. Um, as I said, from the very first conference, he moved the justices his way, okay, and, um, and then in terms of writing opinions and driving a number, Celia Law case, administrative uh, state cases right now, um, Justice Thomas has been writing on that for years. And a Supreme Court decision right on target with what he's doing. Last thing I'll say is the humility of him. Who knows where this will actually come down? But the Dobbs decision leaked, authenticated, right? It's five, five justices, at least in the majority. When you're in the Supreme Court, the senior justice in the majority of the minority assigns the opinion, okay? So he could keep it for himself, okay? The chief isn't there. So Justice Thomas, who's written on more abortion cases and longer than any other justice alive, about its barbarity, but also how it is, in our, you know, it f finds no place in the Constitution, right? Assigned it to Sam Alito. That's going to be one of the most consequential opinions in our lifetime, right? And it could have been a Thomas opinion. And yet, you know, he thought, you know, well, I call it his humility to assign it to Sam Alito to do that job. Uh, and so, anyways, more, uh, a little long answer, but, but. You made a comment about Justice Thomas not speaking. I remember once who was another former law clerk was, was talking and he said that a reporter said, well, Justice Thomas doesn't talk very much. The law clerk said, well, what do you mean? I mean, he really doesn't speak. Well, I'm confused. What do you mean? He goes, he doesn't ask any questions on the bench. He goes, that's the only time he's not talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, along those lines, when we, I, I have to say PBS has given us great support of this film and they liked it right away. And our first meeting, with the president of PBS, we told her about it, and I told her about the 30 hours of interviews, and she said, well, how did you get him to speak? And I, I said the same thing. It's not hard. In fact, he, you know, he asked one question, he would then speak for four minutes. <laughs> I mean, that's what made it a challenge. <laughs> and the president of PBS advised me to say, well, don't tell anybody that, because you should say it's your skill as a director. <laughs> 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 now, I, I, I've never quite gotten around to taking that advice, and now it's impossible. <laughs> Thanks to Mark and you and everybody else. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, over here. Right in the back, back row. And then we'll come down here. Thank you for your remarks. What would you say was better highlighted in the book and then better highlighted in the movie as a, for his story? Oh, I th the, 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 the media are different, so they have different virtues and, and strengths. I, I, I designed the movie to be to, to, so that you can do it, watch it at one sitting. I mean, it was on PBS, and I especially wanted people 
I mean, my wife and I are really dedicated to making documentaries that reach the middle, that don't only preach to the choir. And it was going to be too much to ask people, in spite of Mark liking the nine-hour version, to spend nine hours with Tom, Justice Thomas when you don't even like him in the first place. Make it a series. So, but they wouldn't. I don't think they would have stayed. So, it was designed, and it's designed to be emotionally moving. And you see. Yeah him talk about his life, you can watch his expression, you can watch Ginny's expression, and a couple of times she's sort of near tears, and it's, it's an emotionally moving in a way, and, it, and it's of a piece. So you pull through the entire arc of his life, and I, I think it succeeds in that way, and at the end of it, you know something about him. But the book has depth. I mean, it, it ha there, you know, Mark and also the editor, had all, everyone had their favorites that didn't get in the movie. They all call that in the editing process murder your darlings. You have to do that. You have to make it a film. Each things in a film are metaphors. They have to stand for more things than they are themselves. Yeah. So I too really, even though I, I put it all on Mark, I too wanted to get these things in print as well. And this way you can go to what you're interested in and you can turn to it at any time. Uh, you, the, the, the book is set up to be both chronological and topical. So if you want to know what Justice Thomas thought about abortion or what he thought about his grandfather, yeah. you can go to that section. Um, so it's a way to kind of c continue to familiarize yourself with him and to kind of dip in. And it has a different, it's a different experience. So it has depth, but I think the movie has greater emotional power, which is better. It, I subscribe to what uh, John said earlier. You should buy them both and read and view them both. Yeah, and just, I don't know, if you haven't seen the movie, please watch it. It is such an incredible movie. I'm so happy Michael Pack made it. Uh, and, and, and it really just ca captured Justice Thomas. And I, I agree with Michael. It's that emotional connection of, 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 of listening to Justice and the visuals. And, 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 and you know, that's how you're responding. It covers everything, but just the nature of the movie, it's going to be shorter. So I think the book is, again, just different, uh, but he gets to talk about a lot more things in greater depth and, um, and, and see him how he's thinking. And again, some of these, I love, you know, the, the barbershop, the movie Barbershop he loved because it reminded him of going to the barbershop with his grandfather, you know, every two weeks. And his whole description of sitting in a barbershop in Savannah, Georgia is just hilarious. Uh, and so it's those sorts of things that you're just going to get in the book that I love that you can't fit into a movie. He also makes little movie analogies. He, he talks about the people in his neighborhood who had a quiet dignity and work hard, and he talks about comparing them to the hidden figures. Hidden figures. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was a lot of that. Yeah, let's come down here. Come down in the front row and then the row behind. And what he said on that was... Uh, they, you, they, you talked about his emotional connection. How were those connections with the community he was raised up? Of course, his childhood was very different than, you know, this big family. So does he feel any void in his life for losing those connections or losing that community? Thanks. I don't think he's lost those connections at all. I think he's still close with his, his family down there and um, the, 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 the people he grew up with. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's, you know, when you, when you, Meet Justice Thomas, um, and he connects with everyone at every level. As as, and I'll just give you a, a one one other story. You know, he has a a bus, uh, a coach bus. Where he's kind of famous for driving around, and I've been on a bunch of trips. And he found a mechanic down in um, Richmond uh, that was a great mechanic, worked on his bus, and he became a true friends with this this guy. You know, um, a wonderful guy, um, uh, and. Uh, he, uh, he, he passed away. Uh, he had an accident. He's a motocross, uh, motorcycle, uh, sort of motocross guy, and um, died in a race. And Justice Thomas went to his, his memorial service, and there were like 350 bikers in Justice Thomas, <laughs> right? And he stayed, the he stayed the entire time for hours to talk to every single one of them uh, you know, who came up, and they knew about Clarence Thomas. We'd go down with the bus, and we'd be down uh, with, with him, uh, with this gentleman, with his, he had two sons who worked there, and his wife, and just salt of the earth people, but he, they were friends, you, you know what I mean? And, and that's who Justice Thomas would love to spend his time with. Uh, and, and so he never lost that connection uh, from where he came from. He calls them my people, uh, and he thinks that the folks that 
are, even though he's, he's up at the Supreme Court, those are the folks that are putting these macro theories and ideas where they don't care about people. They just want to satisfy their own ideas of how things should, should, should work and, 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 and be implemented. Um, so I don't think he's ever lost that connection. And, um, you know, and you see it, it's just so genuine when he's out meeting people, um, you know, when we'd stop in a, a gas station or a, we'd stop in a Walmart, we'd sleep in Walmart parking lots and just meet you know, people uh, in, in, in our travels. And he's just, uh, um, he's never forgotten his roots um, and, and never lost that connection with any of them, Go, going back to Pinpoint or going back to Savannah. Um, Take two more questions. I promise this gentleman over here a question, and then we're going to come over here and we'll end with my colleague, Roger. So much conservative media is really centered around ideas, like you're developing a, a solid ideological theme throughout the book, whereas this book is really centered around a person. As a journalist, I'm kind of curious if you could explain some of the unique challenges when you're writing a book focused around a central individual instead of an idea, and then maybe on the movie side as well. What are some of the unique challenges, and what are some of the unique joys? Well, I, I mean, as a filmmaker, that I don't want to make a film based on an idea. I don't believe good films are about ideas. I think they tell stories, and the stories are embedded, the ideas are embedded in the story. And that was the great thing about Connor Thomas. You could be a great man and not necessarily have a great life story. Um, you know, you could have, you could have, there are many people who become Supreme Court justices after having gone to law school and taught afterwards and are very brilliant men and women. He had a great life story and his ideas are embedded in his life story and that's a great thing for a filmmaker. So I think it's an asset, not a liability, and it's particularly an asset if you want to keep your audience watching who don't really care about your ideas and what you think and how important they are. And then this goes to this project I mentioned earlier that we, in, in my wife and I, Manifold Productions, we aim to tell those stories. Those of us on the right have failed to tell our stories. The left is constantly telling their stories and embedding their ideas in their stories. And there are, think of the number of books, films, documentaries, feature films about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a perfectly fine subject for a film. They chose to tell that story. We chose to tell Justice Thomas' story. And a vibrant America needs both, and they need to be out there with some degree of parity where you're seeing a lot of both kinds of stories. But the left dominates the storytelling realm. Maybe not so much the idea realm, thanks to places like heritage. But in the storytelling realm, the left really dominates. And we have failed to tell those stories on our side over many years. We haven't poured the time, energy, money, expertise, talent into the process. And my wife and I are dedicated to making sure that doesn't continue in the future. We are, in addition to doing a bunch of new documentaries. We're starting an incubator to train young right of center filmmakers so people can tell stories and not just make these idea driven films and not to just make films that are, you know, rousing to the base, but tell stories in an impartial manner where the stories communicate the ideas themselves and the filmmaker doesn't have to beat you over the head with the ideas. So we are starting with an incubator and I hope that you and your friends, you know, apply and you know, some people, I know that at places like Heritage, people want to go on and become, you know, either a lawyer like uh, Justice Thomas or a, you know, a, a opinion writer or a pundit or a scholar. And those are all admirable things. But we need on our side way more storytellers, and they need to be trained and encouraged. And the left has a vast ecosystem for doing that, from film schools all the way through the Academy Awards. And we have very little. We need to build it up, and we need talented young people like those in the audience and maybe those you know, tuning in on the web to sort of lend their talents to that. And it, 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 it's, the, the root is at your question. It's storytelling that we need. And, I, and although the book, I, I, the book tells a story too, we toyed with the idea of organizing it by ideas, but in fact, it's Clarence Thomas's story that's compelling. And the book, too, is organized chronologically. And his story is in the book. And I think that's what makes it so an exciting read and an exciting thing to watch and inspiring. It's his story that's inspiring because of him as a person, not just because of these ideas. Some of these ideas people in the audience no doubt have heard before, but you don't hear it Sometimes Thomas, who lived it the way he lived it, and that's I think what I think that I think it's simply an asset, the, the storytelling aspect, not a liability at all. Last question over here to Roger. 
Around, <clears throat> around 17 years ago, Justice Thomas was criticized in the media for not hiring female clerks a particular year. What the media didn't know is that that year, Justice Thomas had deferred a female clerk who was pregnant at the time, my wife, Carrie Severino. So she got to defer a year because Justice Thomas said to her, what's more important is that you take care of your kids and your family. The Supreme Court can wait. That's what Justice Thomas is about. Are there any other misconceptions like that, that if only people knew what the real Justice Thomas is like, that sort of infuriates you that the, the media always gets wrong about Justice Thomas? Remember, we don't have very long. Oh, God. <laughs> 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 I mean, just, I mean, I mean there's, there's, uh, I'd, I'd say everything, you, you know what I mean? That he's uncaring, right? That he's unprincipled, that he, this crazy stuff that's going on right now. Again, with this recusal issue, um, you know, absolutely bogus. I've written a lot on it. Uh, there's no reason for Justice Thomas to recuse on anything uh, regarding his, his Jenny Thomas's activities, uh, and so it's it's just, as Cla as Clarence Thomas says in the book, if they are for you, you can do no wrong. If they're against you, you can do no right. You need to remember that this is a tactic that everything you do is going to be criticized, and somebody like and he said this with you know. Um, Eleanor Holmes Norton, when he took over the EEOC. The EEOC was an absolute disaster when he took it over. He had no uh, record-keeping system, then no personnel uh, 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 systems, uh, record-keeping system. It files all over the places, flea-ridden. And he said, she will never be criticized uh, for this because she's an icon. And he went in and cleaned up the agency. And even the Washington Post said he, he cleaned up and ran it great. Uh, 1986. So it's those things every single day, Roger, that he faces. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, you, you know, um, in terms of this recusal issue I've written on, nobody's ever criticized her uh, for some of the things she's done in, in, in that regard. So um, it's, uh, it's amazing, and a lot of people say this, and the person I was speaking with yesterday in an interview on Tucker Carlson, was that he was amazed how joyful Justice Thomas is when you read about him and uh, the only image you see. But he's just a happy guy who loves to talk to people and loves to laugh uh, about you know, whatever the topic is and engage in serious discussions. He's just joyful and curious and alive. And it burns me up that people don't see that uh, more. Uh, and um, and so he, he's, he doesn't care about it, as, as, as you know. He doesn't care about that. And I think um, trying to correct all those misperceptions, and, and John said we don't have a long time, uh, you know, um, on so many slights to him. Um, last um, two things. Um, Clarence Thomas, when he was going through this process, um, and, and when the movie was first kind of signed off on, Clarence Thomas had not agreed to be interviewed uh, by Michael Pack. And Michael Pack was a little bit worried, and I kept telling him, because he has made great movies, that, Michael, you made a movie on George Washington, you made a movie on Alexander Hamilton, and you didn't interview them. <laughs> and so certainly you can make a great documentary on Clarence Thomas, because uh, you'll have clips and video clips. You don't need to talk to him. Um, but he finally um, agreed to be interviewed. And typical of Clarence Thomas, where I think I sort of suggested it was probably six hours, he went all in, and it was 25 hours uh, of, of interviews. Second thing is, he said, if you really want to understand me, you need to interview my wife. Uh, and so Ginny is so compelling in her interview that actually the appendix of the book has uh, about 30 pages of the excerpts from her, her, her interview with her interviews uh, with Michael. Um, so uh, there's, there's misperceptions, misconceptions, smears every single day. Uh, but he's our greatest justice. He's our greatest living American. And um, we're really happy we're able to make this movie and do this book to, to get his story out there. And we are, um, we are very happy that all of you came today. So that applause is obviously for, for Michael and for Mark and also for uh, Justice uh, Thomas and Ginny. I hope you're out there. Uh, please buy the book, watch the movie. We have copies for sale right outside, and Michael and Mark will uh, be happy to sign them. And once again, please join me in thanking Michael Pack and Mark.